So, your uncle. What's wrong with him? He's possessed. As in the devil? Something like that. He says a dark man is following him. Watching him at all times. What do you make of it? It's nonsense, of course. But I'd be lying if I said it didn't bother me. You see, it runs in my family. Possession? No, detective. Deteriorating melancholy. Practically every member of the Hartwood family is driven mad before they grow old. But Jeremy didn't kill himself. Is that why he's at your setup? Despite being convinced that he is truly possessed, he decided to put his last chips on Dr. Gray and his psychoanalysis, figuring he might stumble upon some cure. You mentioned the letter. I received a disturbing letter from Jeremy accusing the staff and all the other patients of being involved in some cult. And now they are also out to keep him. Could it be real? Or is it all just in his head? It's a story he tells himself, Mr. Carnby. Anything to avoid the truth. Which is? That we're all terribly insignificant. That people mean so very little to one another. That there is no one out to get Jeremy Hartwood because he isn't worth getting. Here we are. My uncle's not well, Mr. Carnby. I want to make sure he's all right. Then what's my part in this? You couldn't get a cab? I just wouldn't feel safe going alone. Did you bring a gun? Yeah. You think it'll actually come to that? No. But you might need to wave it around, depending on how agreeable the staff will be. What exactly are we going to do when we find Jeremy? I don't know. Let's just find him first. abandoned. It can't be. There has to be someone around. Wait here. I'll go around back. It's too dark in here. I can't see anything. I need the key.
Now what do we got here? getting in there. Tree defense of the observatory. Huh? What? Mind if I do? Every day your silence weighs a little heavier. It's been a difficult year for everyone and many have lost all hope. I read in the papers about people suffering. Pictures of dust-covered landscapes without a drop of water. I wish I knew if you were still tending the earth or if you had turned your back against us. I have started to look for help elsewhere. I pray you will tell me if I am going down a path that you find disagreeable. With help from Batiste and Charlotte, I found comfort in the practice of the voodoo. I have long been skeptical of that Caribbean cult, but it's been of good use to me. It seems all harmless in my book. I say some words dreamt up by the Creoles, and I carry around a small pocket of Grigri. Nothing of this is mentioned in the Bible, of course, but the French quarter priestess tells me it's all connected. She says the Christian God is just one more perspective on the creator of things. That's what I like to think, but the other way around. That the spirits of her faith are just aspects of you, our Heavenly Father. I am so grateful for the words you gave Mr. Hartwood. We will sing your praises at St. John's Eve. The world will be blessed soon again. Only the sacrifices of the Old Testament compare to your demands. Let it be the truth. A mother of earth, wood, and dirt. A mother of a thousand young. Sacred sand, one dollar. Black cat oil, dollar fifty. Devil shoe strings, a quarter. That makes two dollars and seventy-five cents, madame. What was that you were telling the doctor? A goat without horns. What does that mean? Ah, you must have misheard me, madame. I said no such thing. Please. I know I don't look like any of you, but I'm devout. I'm ready to do what it takes. Mm. Do not be so eager to sacrifice the few things you have left, madam. Now please, 
Need my store. A goat without horns. What was that? Please do not touch the boiler. It is working after all. While the sabotage has caused a leak, only the decorative plate has been completely ruined. Let's wait for Mr. Chance to turn up and he can take a look at the leak. Mr. Waits. That's it. Sunday, June 22nd. I spent all day looking for Jeremy. 
I should have cared for the others, but I'm scared that he will do something irreversible. Cassandra is upset that I didn't give her the latest shipment of pain medication that Waits brought from the post office yesterday. I would have given it to her, but the company didn't send a new key this time around, so the box is just sitting there on my desk. They must have figured we had plenty of their gimmicky keys by now. I only remember seeing one lately. Grace was playing with it inside the grand parlor. Unless it turns up by itself, it will have to wait. I have to figure out where Jeremy is. I think Jack knew something. That dog of his found a strange rot permeating the house. She's showing us, he said. Like those blots and streaks of fetid rot was talking to him. need the key. The Great Depression. President Hoover raises tariffs on over 20,000 imported goods in an act to protect American labor. Following the collapse of the Wall Street stock market on October 24 last year, American industry has suffered greatly. Thousands of companies have gone bankrupt and left a large part of the American workforce unemployed. In an attempt to turn the tide, the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act has been signed by President Herbert Hoover. By regulating commerce with foreign countries, the government hopes to encourage the industries of the United States to compete with cheap foreign imports. Superstition on rise. New Orleans voodoo stores and spiritual mediums see increased profit during troubled times. While the market has faced hard times ever since Black Thursday of last year, voodoo doctors and snake charmers see significant rise in number of customers. With the coming eve of St. John on the 23rd, the police expect increased cult activity around Bayou St. John, the southern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. Voodoo rituals in that area on the eve of St. John have a long tradition reaching back to the first snake worshippers brought as slaves from West Africa. During the 19th century, its practice was popularized by the legendary Marie Laveau and has since been embraced by many of the Creoles and a surviving aristocracy of the French Quarter. Author seeks asylum. Rumors regarding author Cassandra Beauregard making Dorsetto her home verified. Dorsetto Hospital is an old plantation building on the eastern shores of Lake Pontchartrain. While often considered an asylum for the insane, residing Dr. Elmore Lee Gray prefers to think of it as a convalescent home, a place where you can go to rest. The patient list is kept secret, but thought to include many of the black sheep of wealthy families, because at Dorsetto, treatment does not come for free. Local author Cassandra Beauregard has now been confirmed by her own admission. She's been lauded as a powerful Creole voice and written many successful books. Lately it was reported from Hollywood that she has finished a moving picture manuscript titled Slaughter Gulch. That film is set to hit the theaters next year. the key.
Thanks. What are you doing? Who are you? Whoa, pardon me, excuse me. My name is Edward Carnby, private investigator. I hope you don't mind we let ourselves inside. I do mind. This is private property. You can't just barge in here. I'm sorry about all this, but I'm looking for my uncle. It's urgent, and no one was answering the door. We can't hear you knocking anymore. None of us can. Who is your uncle, darling? Jeremy. Am I right? She has that Hartwood gloom, doesn't she? That's right. I'm Emily Hartwood. I just came to make sure my uncle is all right. Well, he is unavailable right now. He will have to come back another day. Unavailable? How? Is he sleeping? We can wait. He's lost. Don't I know you from somewhere? Who's your man again, Miss Hartwood? My name's Edward Carnby. Private investigator. Splendid. Enough! All of you, get back to your rooms. The coffee, keep your eyes on the child. And you two, please leave immediately. Look, we're not here to cause any trouble. Just let us see the old man, satisfy the curiosity of my client here, and we'll be off. Jeremy has gone missing. There's no need to worry, but it might be some time before he turns up. The whole staff is looking for him. What? He ran off? I don't have time for any of this. Please, come back tomorrow. All right, in that case, we'll just wait in his room. You don't mind, do you? It's upstairs, right? Wait, you can't. Don't worry, we'll be discreet. In the corridor, it's the first door on your left. I'll tell Dr. Gray you're here. Excellent, thank you, madam. Let's look around, see if we can dig up any clues. Anything important I should look out for? Did he keep a diary? Not that I know of, but it wouldn't surprise me. Every night the dark man stands opaque at the threshold of my room, counting the days until my spirit spills out of my tired shape. Only his pallid mask shelters my remaining sanity. Staring directly into the face of that demonic sultan would surely sunder time itself. Would he have looked the same to my father as he struggled for his life? Does his veiled face haunt my niece quite the same way? I wish so that I could rest my soul in that sunburnt convent of Tarawea. Would I find you there, Juan? Or Senora Perosi? Back from the beyond. Every night I hide from him, moving from one misshapen memory to another. Scenes conjured out of fantasy and delirium. Places I struggle to even paint. I wish I understood your death, Signora. Is there anything I could do for you but bury you in that bleak necropolis? That triumphant chapel rising above the ledges and the oven vaults shall be your sepulchre, where you may rest, and I shall weep. Hey, 
You know anything about this? Looks like some sort of talisman. No, I don't. Oh, help me out here, will you? I would kill the guy, throw some of this stuff out. I'd be crazy too if I had this much junk lying around. Save this one. All right, come on. I want to go see Dr. Gray. Come on, let's go. Yeah, I'm coming. Miss Hartwood. Emily? Christ, what the hell is that?
My weapon broke. Let them get inside, Carver. They're not the good guy. Are you... Is this your store? There are no owners here. We both strangers in Jeremy's store. Jeremy did this? How? A pact with the dog, man. Jeremy warned us, but we didn't think much of it. I'm Detective Edward Carnby. I was hired by Jeremy's niece to find him. Oh, yeah? How much you paying you? $150. <laughs> She's sure getting her money's worth tonight. Are you a thinking man, compare? No, not if I can help it. You know, I think Jeremy's hiding in a way we can't find him. He has this juju necklace that guides him. The talisman? That's right. It's some magic charm he got for Miss Jackson down the street. The voodoo priestess? You know surprising things, compare. Yeah, the mama lower. Here, take the key. I locked the gate to save her place from all the ghouls and goblins getting inside. Maybe if you go there, you can find some clues to show you the way. Thanks. I'll have a look. Detective Conby hesitated to buy into the stranger's explanation, but it was all he had. Baptiste, this mountain of a man, seemed to suggest that this other world they had been pulled into was built from Jeremy's scattered memories. It sounded crazy to him, but Conby couldn't exactly deny the situation he found himself in. Baptiste believed Jeremy was able to move freely between worlds using a talisman he got from Miss Jackson, a voodoo witch doctor that made a good living from alleviating the rich from their ailments and their money. In hope to find Jeremy, or a way back to DeSetto, Conby set out to investigate Miss Jackson's place. You want to come along? Nah, I'm going to stay here for a while.
Talisman, like the one in the painting. I think it's meant for the talisman. I think it needs numbers, like coordinates. Maybe there's something in Jeremy's notes. He wrecked. showing something. A place? Where is that? Huh. Detective, I was wondering when you were going to show up. 
Mrs. Thompson told me you were here. I understand you are working for Jeremy Hartwood's niece. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you're not wrong. We came here for her uncle. I just didn't expect... I didn't expect this. You are Dr. Gray, right? That's right. You don't happen to have some identification, Detective. I'm not keen on having strangers prying into my business. Oh, Detective Edward Carnby, Decatur Street, New Orleans. Enjoying the view carré, detective? Those old French quarters, the voodoo people, the gangsters. I'm sure you live an exciting life. Well, that's not quite like the stories, Doc. Just trying to make a living. Aren't we all making a living? Well, welcome to Dossetto, detective. I hope your time here will be useful. Now, what can I do for you? Why don't you tell me where I can find Jeremy Hartwood? <laughs> Why wouldn't that make for a short visit? I wish I could tell you, but I'm afraid I don't know. A drink, detective? Anything brandy. Oh, you do belong in the French quarters, detective. Armagnac or cognac? You know, just give me the cheap stuff. I'm not much of a connoisseur. Having low standards is not a virtue, detective. Let me see if I can broaden your perspective. What can you tell me about Jeremy? I wouldn't want to go into details about his condition. Doctor-patient confidentiality. I'm sure you understand. Sure. But he is crazy. And he's gone missing. Why? Here. Try this. Ooh, it's good. Got a bite. <laughs> it's called a side. The trick is not to be afraid of the tartness of the lemon. Then, for goodness sake, don't overdo the triple sec. Okay, what can you tell me about Jeremy? Ah, oh, well, let me think. He is an anxious man, constantly worried about events not presenting themselves according to his model of predestination. He complains about things not being carried out in the right order, and that some things simply shouldn't be. Is any of this helpful to you? Uh, not really. Uh, I was hoping for some direction where to look next. I'm sorry. I have nothing for you then. You should talk to my orderlies. They have been looking for him for a while now. I'm sure they would appreciate your help. Yeah, I ran into Batiste earlier. Come to think of it, he... He might have given me a lead. Oh, excellent. So your investigation is already underway. I'm gonna go, but I'm sure we'll meet again. Looking forward to it. Safe returns. Detective Carnby, how did you... where did you go? I was just talking to Dr. Gray. You disappeared. No, it's not what you think. Have you... have you found anything strange going on here? Yes. Everyone is being incredibly evasive and I can't figure out why. No, I mean something you can't explain. Paranormal, even. Detective? I really need you to get yourself together. I can't do this alone. Forget it. I'll figure it out. Do you want to come see Dr. Gray? No. I want to, I want to try something else. With this talisman, I think I can follow Jeremy to the place he mentioned in the book. What was the name? Do you remember something Spanish? T Tarawea. Yeah, that's where I need to go. Detective? Are you going to be all right? Yeah, of course. Go talk to Dr. Gray. We'll rendezvous later. This talisman brought me back from the French Quarter in the blink of an eye. 
If Jeremy can travel so easily, then he could be hiding anywhere, even Teruea. If he can do it, so can I. I just need to figure out how the talisman works. in the boiler room. You should know Mr. Chance won't be coming back. I got no business being in there myself, but you can take a valve from the wine cellar if you wanna try to stop the steam pouring out. Be careful. Dr. Elmore Lee Gray is DeSetto's chief doctor. Accounting and all administrative work is handled by me, Paul Waits. Magdalena Thompson, or Mags, is responsible for the household. Jean-Baptiste and Charlotte Tabois are responsible for keeping the guests' medical regiments in check. Finally, Jack Chance is our gardener, who can occasionally be seen in the conservatory, but is, for the most part, busy outside. There are currently six guests at Dosetto. Malcolm McCarthy and Ruth Talant reside on the first floor. Jeremy Hartwood, Elisabetta Perosi, Grace Saunders, and of course, Cassandra Beauregard live on the second floor. Paul, you're right about the plates on the boiler and the clock. They have been sabotaged, and I think I know who did it. They have something to do with Jeremy's episodes and how he seems to disappear at night. Right now, it's important that you keep an eye out for any of the pieces. I want to find out if I can repair the plates. Let me know if you find any of them. Lottie. Tell Lottie to take a look at the well in the kitchen garden. I need the key. Cassandra Beauregard, the beloved author. Very exciting, isn't it? What do you want to put down for reason for admission? What her agent told us. Cassandra suffers from a writer's block and needs to finish her moving picture script before the end of June. Mr. Chardot suggests Cassandra's heavy use of barbiturates is holding her back and risks ruining her career. And how should we summarize her personal history? Let's keep it short. Cassandra Beauregard is a beloved crime author who managed to pull herself out of poverty and into stardom. Five years ago, she tried killing herself by jumping off a balcony. The incident left her a cripple and now relies heavily on her wheelchair. And for diagnostic impressions? Cassandra suffers chronic back pain following her suicide attempt. She self-administers morphine to keep herself ambulant, but has become addicted and the desired effect is now lost. The drug abuse clouds her mind and she is unable to focus on real life. To save herself from this insight, she instead makes up stories to fill out the gaps in her own thought process, resembling the Korsakoff syndrome. Oh, bravo, Doctor. How will you treat her? First of all, she needs to be weaned from her drug addiction, and hopefully it will resolve her compulsive lying. Then look into permanently numbing her pain in her back through surgery. Finally, deal with her suicidal thoughts. Fantastic. With such a short time before June, I really hope she gets better soon. We will do what we can.
Grace Saunders, 11 years old. Reason for admission? The mother insists on strict supervision by a proper gentleman to avoid further perversion of Grace's adolescence. Personal history? Grace's family possesses modest wealth and status. Her childhood seems ordinary, spending most of her time with private teachers and family friends. Grace's father recently passed away, leaving her mother the sole caregiver. And diagnostic impressions? Grace has trouble dealing with her father's death. She is willingly suppressing her feelings on the matter and isn't properly acknowledging the trauma she suffered. Any planned treatment? Grace needs nothing out of the ordinary. She simply needs parental guidance. Eventually, we can work on her feelings toward her father. Thank you, Doctor. I'll finish the paperwork and get her installed. Malcolm McCarthy, 54 years of age. Reason for admission? McCarthy admitted himself to Dossetto, stating simply that he needs some damn rest. And personal history. McCarthy claims he used to work as a lawyer in Baton Rouge, but says he can't go into details because of some legal dispute. His background remains largely a mystery, except for the occasional clue that he drops in conversation. Huh. And diagnostic impressions. McCarthy is an anxious man and an alcoholic. He often tells half-truths due to some deep-seated inability to trust other people. And how will you treat that? McCarthy will take some time to open up. Spending time with Jack's dog or the child should be good for him. Their harmless nature will help build his sense of trust. Thank you, Doctor. Elisabetta Perosi, 33 years old? What should I put down as reason for admission? Well, Perosi broke into Dorsetto and was found wandering the Grand Parlor. She was confused and suffered partial amnesia. She insisted she belonged here and offered to pay for her stay. Right. What do you make of her story? Perosi claims to have been a member of the Astarte Artist Colony some 20 years ago. A claim that seems contrafactual due to her young age. She looks to be and even thinks she is 33 years of age. That would make her a child at the time. It seems fair to say that Perosi's story is untrue, deliberately so or not. Diagnostic impressions? Do you have anything? Perosi's story is peculiar, because she retracted her story about the artist colony. She no longer claims to be the same person as Elisabetta Perosi. However, my staff's research has confirmed there was a Perosi at that time who was in her early thirties. I suppose this case will take some time to investigate. How will you go about it? I wanted to contact the real Perosi, but it seems the whole colony disappeared one night. September 29th, 1915, during a hurricane. I will have to take it slow and figure out what this spell of impersonation could have been. Oh, I'm sure it will all clear up eventually. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Ruth Talon, 29 years of age. Reason for admission? Uh, Ruth's father wishes that his daughter be removed from New Orleans nightlife for the foreseeable future. He fears that her overly free spirit is tarnishing the family's reputation. Sounds simple enough. Personal history? Ruth comes from considerable wealth. Her family owns several hotels and restaurants. Unlike the rest of the family, her sense of adventure has taken her around the world, including France during the Great War as a photojournalist. The last decade, she has provoked many rumors of being a debauched flapper, bordering on nymphomania. And diagnostic impression? Despite her father's frivolous reasons for her to be admitted, Ruth does seem to provide an interesting case. She is refreshingly open and doesn't shy away from talking about her life during the war or her continuous celebration after returning to the States. She is admittedly a sexual deviant and feels no remorse. And her treatment plan? Simply staying at Dorsetto should do wonders for Ruth. If not, at least for her family's reputation. 
Ruth doesn't need to change, but with therapy, I might be able to share with her some sympathy towards her family. I doubt she will settle down and become as dull as the rest of them, but at least she might try to be more discreet in the future. Looks like all the patients are accounted for. There's no way I can get into this thing. Better leave it alone. Lost Plantations of Louisiana, Thierry Bricklow, 1917. The Assetto was a small plantation on the eastern shore of Lake Pontchartrain. The land was considered difficult for industry and was sold for only $30 to Elia Pickford in 1818. Pickford employed hundreds of workers from nearby New Orleans to clear the woods and build a small plantation mansion facing the lake with a striking Greek Revival temple facade. Desetto kept a modest production of barrique tobacco and indigo that persisted up till the Civil War. During the antebellum era, Desetto was the source of many rumors concerning voodoo and witchcraft. People who traveled the lake reported seeing people dance at night in front of bonfires, bleating and wailing. On June 17, 1862, Captain J.W. Norton of the Union Army recounts leading a raiding party from ships anchored in Lake Pontchartrain in order to seize control of Desetto and free the slaves working there. The captain was surprised to find the workers fighting back with unprecedented zeal. Norton's account describes these men and women as enraged with fanaticism. Pickford reportedly tried to placate the raiders, but was shot in the confusion. Captain Norton left the mansion burning and retreated to his ships with his men. Their seto was left in ruins for several decades. The ownership of the land was long disputed and returned to the Ledoux family in 1901. Several police reports were filed during the following years as the Ledoux tried to get rid of a camp of squatters on their land. The police made several visits to remove the trespassers, but the people kept returning. On November 1, 1907, Inspector Legras of the police charged a deadly attack in order to save several children kidnapped by the squatters. Many were killed, and even more were jailed. The following year, Ledoux rebuilt Desetto, incorporating the surviving stone foundation and adding a magnificent wrought iron conservatory. The farmland had been reclaimed by the surrounding woods, so it was no longer profitable to use as a plantation. Instead, the house was turned into an artist's colony, the Astarte Artist Colony was a successful group of artists, including figures such as painter Heinrich Cassel and poet Nora Keith. The group was also known for their beloved Mardi Gras crew called the Pirates of Pontchartrain. On September 29, 1915, a tropical hurricane tore through Louisiana, causing Lake Pontchartrain to flood New Orleans. Due to the remote location of their settle, it took almost two weeks for outsiders to learn that the artist's colony was abandoned. The twelve residing artists had all vanished without a trace. The empty mansion of Der Seto still stands on the shore of Lake Pontchartrain, with much of its temple facade intact. The Ledoux family currently has no intention of repairing the house.
It's wedged shut. What happened? Everything's normal again? While Detective Combi was grateful to be back at Deceto, he was eager. <laughs> 